Hey, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Product in LA podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Cole, and this is an opportunity to share, to shine the spotlight on some of the exceptional product leaders we have as part of the LA product community. With me today is David Coleman. Hey, Ethan, how are you doing? It's good to be here. Uh, it's great to have you. Excited to, to chat with you today. Um, as always, the Product in LA podcast is brought to you by the Product Managers Association Los Angeles. PMA LA, which is available at pma.la, is the largest product managers organization in Los Angeles with over 2,000 members. They put on community events about every month to learn about their upcoming event. Please go to pma.la. They also do a mentorship program where they connect working product managers with uh, students from underrepresented groups to build a more diverse next generation of product people. Uh, I believe at this point they have connected over 250 students with working product managers. So to learn more about that program, to become a mentor, or if you want to nominate a mentee, go to pma.la slash mentorship. Today, our, as I mentioned, our guest is David Coleman. He is the Director of Product Management of Predictive Analytics at Media Alpha, and his past roles include Lead Product Manager for Reporting and Analytics at Cornerstone On Demand, as well as Group Product Manager at Upside Business Travel. Really excited to talk more about data product management with David, but one thing you may not know is that he's a varsity athlete uh, David was on the MIT swim team. Is that true, David? That is true. Uh, I was a competitive swimmer from probably the age of eight through graduating college. And I think I had my, my last real competitive race back in 2004. And since then, it's just been you know, open water swims and trying not to be eaten by sharks. <laughs> Any triathlons or, or those types of competitions? Uh, not since I was in high school, no. Uh, you reach a certain age where you enjoy the, uh, let's call it the low impact of being in the water as opposed to running on the ground. I bet uh, 10, 10 years of intense program uh, of intense activity will do that to you and training. It absolutely will. That's awesome. Well, thank you for joining us once again. Um, you know, for the first question, we always ask our guests here, uh, because product management is such a and broad field that really had no education straight line to it. Um, many of our product managers have interesting journeys into product management. Uh, David, love to learn about your story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'd, I'd started my career on the software engineering side. Um, I'd had my undergrad at MIT in computer science, and then I went to doing a lot of uh, consulting work with uh, the government, a lot of defense work, a lot of intel. And they, MIT and the government at the time all did what we called technology push, which was the idea was someone invents an amazing piece of technology. It's going to change the world or at least some small part of the world. And the question is, how do you transfer that tech to people? Because it's self-evident that the tech is what matters. Um, and, I, and I worked kind of in that way for about uh, almost a decade, I'd say. I was uh, doing science and technology consulting. I was doing engineering management. Um, I was helping to identify, you know, what kind of technology should be developed, uh, helping people bring products to market, uh, doing a lot of solutions architecting and figuring out how you could uh, stitch together pieces from private industry and the government and academia to do two cool things. Um, but I, I think I realized after, you know, almost a decade of this that, I didn't really enjoy the engineering part as much as a lot of my peers did. Um, and there was just something about the whole philosophy that wasn't really working for me. Um, just this idea that you start with engineering and from there comes something useful. It's kind of like sometimes we see now in BC where the idea is you start with funding and from there something useful must come. Right. Um, and, and I'd started to realize that the, the part I was really enjoying had always been the talking to customers, talking to users, figuring out what they actually needed. Um, and I, at this point, didn't really know what product was. Uh, it was, this was you know, mid 2010. So it was starting to become a lot more well-known, uh, not as much on the East Coast, but uh, we were starting to hear about it. But what I actually did was get an MBA. Um, so I, 
I, I got an MBA while I was working. I moved over from sort of pure engineering to more of a strategic M&A role and started to get exposed to this idea that, hey, you can, you can actually fulfill some kind of technology vision by acquiring companies rather than just by building the technology yourself. Um, right. I, I did that for a bit. Um, and I, I also realized that was something I wasn't great at. Um, I was okay at it, but as, when it got really sort of literal and technology focused, I could figure it out. When it got to the finances, I could figure it out. But a, a lot of it was just still a little bit too removed from what we were actually trying to solve. Um, and around this time, I started to really do some reading and, and find out that product was a thing. Um, and in the sort of Washington, D.C. area, it, it really wasn't a thing yet. Uh, but certainly on the West Coast, it had been a thing for a very long time. On the East Coast, we were just hearing about it. Um, and I pitched that, hey, how about uh, we're, we're, we're going to try this out. How about I be one of our first product managers and I take this, this company we acquired and try and productize the technology stack. Um, and it was, uh, it was kind of a, a new approach to some stuff that I tried to do before. Uh, so, so really, you kind of made a role for yourself in product management. Yeah, exactly. And around that time, that was almost the only way I knew of anyone getting into product was you couldn't get hired without experience. There was no such thing as a product degree, really, at least that I knew of. Uh, so you had to kind of do a lateral transfer from, in my case, from the engineering side, but I heard of other people who do it from the, cu the customer service side or the marketing side or the design side. Um, but it, it definitely was the idea that you needed to, within your current company, convince them to let you to move over to product. And once that was under your belt, then you could go get a product job somewhere. Was that you? Because I've heard it in other instances where it was someone who was familiar with product, someone who maybe spent time in Silicon Valley or the West Coast, then said, hey, do you know you actually are a product manager? Or was it you coming to your own self-realization that... Actually, these are the things that I love. And I guess I, I've been a product manager all along. I just didn't know it. I, I'd say that I was curious as to whether that was true. Because when I read what a product manager did, it seemed incredibly similar to what I'd been doing all this time of you know trying to solve people's problems with technology. Um, once I got into it, I realized that the big difference was that I was used to mainly building products for people for people who I was talking to, that I didn't have to build a product for a theoretical customer or for someone who we hadn't met yet. I could just say, okay, well, we have, we're trying to sell some work to so-and-so. We go talk to them. We figure out what the requirements are. We do some solutions architecting. I talk to some of their users. Um, but most of the people that would encounter the product were available before the product was built. Uh, and, and the big difference I found once I really got into product management is that that's flipped on its head. That if you spend all your time talking to your existing customers, you build something that no one else wants because, you know, the, your existing customers, by definition, were fine with what you already had to some extent. And if you really want to be successful on product, you need to find a way to talk to the customers you don't have who haven't found what you already built to be good enough. That's great. And it's, it's awesome to hear that, you know, this is something, and everyone has a different origin story, that came from your own inflection point of identifying, hey, here's a need that we have as a company, and you know, here's the forward-looking piece of it. It's not just what we were doing before. It's not even just what these people are doing over there. Uh, I think that's kind of the fun of product management, especially with you know, this generation of folks who, who are really the, you know, the pioneers in the field. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, kind of to extend the uh, the sponsorship message you said earlier, it's been I've, I've been working with the mentorship program you referenced, and it's been very, very interesting to speak to younger folks who are learning about product in the first place. And they don't need to kind of stumble their, their way there from some other path and suddenly have this revelation of, oh, you know, the product was inside me all along. Like they're <laughs> actually getting a degree in it, learning about it from the beginning, learning how to talk to customers, understanding, you know, the idea of building something for a more abstract user segment rather than having very hard requirements written in a document somewhere. Um, and it, I, I can kind of see 
some of the false paths that they're just not going down when I talk to them. And I'm like, oh man, that, 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 that might've been great in some ways to uh, have actually learned about this a, a little bit more academically before I got thrown into trying to do it in the real world. Yeah. And good call out, David, full disclosure. Yeah, I'm the president of the product manager association, Los Angeles. So i um, very thankful to be a part of that organization. And, you know, it's that finding the person who gave you that first opportunity uh, what was it like trying to convince that first boss to, to let you run product, to invent product for, for the company? Uh, it was actually incredibly easy. Um, it was, uh, it was a guy who I'd had a lot of conversations with. It was basically transferring over into another department and working as a product manager for him, but we got, got along really well. And we'd been looking for a way I could work with him for a while. And it just kind of ended up being one of those kind of karmic things where uh, I had just wrapped up. We'd, we'd sold the company. I'd wrapped up a bunch of the M&A work I'd done. I was sort of looking to get into product anyways. He was looking to launch a product function and had started to transition one or two people over. Uh, so it was just great timing for me to say, well, I'll, psh, I mean, I, I can see an opportunity when I see it. Like, let's let's get involved together here and, and figure out how we can bring product into a company that hasn't really been doing product very much. That's awesome. It sounds like a little bit of kismet that was, is involved in that. Absolutely. Uh, so let's fast forward to, you know, your time at media alpha. How do you do product management now? Yeah. Uh, so I'd say that the, the through line through my career has been, you know, my, my title usually has data in the name. Uh, which has meant various different things, but it usually means there's probably machine learning involved. There's definitely some form of analytics involved. I definitely know what the data pipelines look like. And the, the value I'm delivering to end users is in some way data enabled, like either they're understanding data be better or data is helping them make better decisions. Um, and I'd say with that being the through line, it's been very, very different at every single company I've worked with, what the product functions role is and how it interacts with engineering, design, all the other functions. Um, at Media Alpha, it's been very interesting to be somewhere where engineering really runs the show when it comes to tech. Um, they are all very smart. They all have pretty good business heads on them. And they can handle all of the tactical product management, like all the stuff that's like, hey, should we add this little feature or not? Like, should we add this little widget or not? Uh, how should we prioritize these bug fixes? They are perfectly capable of looking at the revenue, looking at what that feature could bring in for more revenue or saving costs or what have you, and do the near-term tactical decision-making of what's the priority of these things. Um, and I've worked other places where all prioritization lands on product and you end up spending a lot of your time kind of negotiating small projects. Um, you're, you're spending a lot of time, say, prioritizing the bug backlog or figuring out what technical debt should happen or possibly, you know, j just deciding like, hey, should we, should we redo this page a little bit, make the buttons a little glossier and run some A-B tests and this, that, the other. Um, for the most part at Media Alpha, product's there to do more big strategic things. Like we're there to do something that isn't an incremental climbing of the same hill. We're there to say like, hey, here's a, here's a new area that we haven't been in and we should launch a new product. Or we should take an existing product that isn't really hitting the potential we want and it really needs like a more strategic reimagining. Um, so an example of that would be that we have been running uh, some predictive analytics products for our customers where, uh, you know, four or five years ago when we started to get into it more, the, the thing was everyone needed modeling done for them. They were looking for you to come up with a full encompass solution that says, hey, we've been, it's wrapped up in this nice little API. Uh, you call our endpoint and it just tells you what to do. Uh, it makes decisions for you and you don't have to do any data science work on your own. Um, what's happened since then is that everyone has a data science team now. Uh, everyone right. has started to move their BI team over to be data scientists, either 
strategically because the company wants that because it's valuable to have it or because the individual folks want it on their resume. So now when you show up and you say, hey, I've, I built these models for you. We have a machine learning product. The internal data science team says, why would we use you? Uh, right. So it's been uh, kind of a pivot for us to say, all right, how can we be a data product instead? How can we provide uh, machine learning features to these teams that are popping up everywhere? And how can we offload the piece that we're you know, not differentiated on? And how can we stick to the things where we are differentiated? Um, so it was a chance to do like a little bit of introspection of what's the actual value we're providing once machine learning gets more commoditized. And it's, it's been a really successful pivot because now when we show up and say like, hey, we've got this new data source for you, it'll boost your models and make them awesome. Now there's product market fit. Now the data scientists that we're selling to are our champions and want us to get in the door. Whereas before it was kind of a, oh, uh, let's just make sure you're not a competitor first. Um, so, so, so go on, Ethan. No, it's, it sounds like uh, at Media Alpha, product has the opportunity to actually focus more on just strategy than the kind of the product ownership tactical items that are going to the engineering team. Yeah, absolutely. And I've worked in places where, you know, product is very, very hands-on product touches every single ticket product owns every part of the backlog. But, and by definition, the backlog is the thing that product owns. And most product managers would tell you that their primary responsibility is grooming and maintenance of that backlog so that the engineers can just grab things and work on them. And I've, I've worked other places where uh, it's more collaborative. You bring engineering on earlier. They're part of the decision-making and problem-solving process and you come up with something together. Um, and Media Alpha is a bit more like that. And it's also, but, but when it comes to something really incremental, the product manager shows up, they're like, well, what do you, I mean, we don't, we don't really need your help with adding this button here. Um, what we need your help with is realizing that don't we need some infrastructure for do, running these A-B tests? Don't we need some infrastructure for how we're rolling out models? Like, can you please go and develop some requirements around the big ticket things we need to take bigger swings and come back with that? Um, and that's been uh, very different in ways to some of the other places. And uh, honestly, fantastic, because it just frees my brain up to do uh, some bigger things and not every day be like, oh, we've got grooming and then we've got planning and then we've got stand up and then we've got all of the, you know, sprint ceremonies that tend to suck up a bit of your time as a PM. Yeah, no, it's fun. It sounds like what you guys are doing in media alpha is similar to what Marty just Kagan describes as, you know, good product management, you know, moving away from some of that product owner tactical stuff, like, you know, the writing the tickets, the ceremonies, but actually getting into building the product that your customer wants. Uh, and solving their problems. Yeah, and I, I don't want to say that that stuff is bad because in the organizations where I've done it, that was necessary. Um, that there's there's times when you really do need to have a stronger product hand to help focus engineering and help bring the customer's voice to the table. It's not a given in every engine in every engineering org that they have enough surface area contact with the folks who are using the products for them to even have the insight to come up with ideas or to figure out the best way to do things. Um, we're, we're a little bit blessed that our engineers have that a little bit more naturally. So I don't have to spend a lot of time bringing the customer voice to the table, but I've been in other places where just due to the size of the org or the way the product is structured, that doesn't happen as organically. And then it's, it's very important for the product manager to touch more things and to come in with that stronger customer perspective on everything and say, Hey, you know, here's some full story recordings. Here's some user interviews I've done. Here's everything else that you may not have been exposed to. Um, and just really be much more involved in shaping what we're going to do before we do it. So it's, it's very organization specific. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, shifting gears a bit, um, you know, you've focused your career in data product management. Love to hear your thoughts on, where that is headed you know what is what does data product management look like in the three to five and then maybe the 10-year horizon 
Yeah, I mean, I think I've been seeing this convergence uh, between data product management and product management, where now if I say, you know, I'm a data product manager, other product managers say, well, yeah, so am I. Like, what <laughs> What do you even mean by that? <laughs> um, and there's kind of, uh, you know, three three kinds of data we, we tend to look at as product managers. We've got, you know, have it, having data actually be the product where you're selling a data stream or a data feed or an API or something like that. Um, that, that I think is kind of the pure data product management. Um, what used to be a bit more data product management that is now a little bit more uh, everybody's problem is the data that's in the product. You know, you've got inventory flying around if you're doing e-commerce, you've got maps if you're doing geospatial stuff. Um, product managers know what the data in their product looks like and they understand where it comes from and they understand how it got that way. And that's just become, I think, part of uh, everyday usage of being a product manager. And, th and that's starting to include, hey, you know, we need to have a better sort algorithm. Like we don't need a dedicated data product manager for that, like me and you know, a, a data scientist can just go do something off the shelf and improve our sort and we can improve, throw in a recommendation engine without needing to be a subject matter expert. Um, and I think that piece of it is just being subsumed by uh, other product managers who understand the customer better and can do stuff out of the box a bit more. Um, and we're also starting to see uh, the customers and users themselves understanding the data better where they're expecting a dashboard. They're expecting that year end report from Spotify that tells them, you know, how many songs they listen to and of what kind or the weekly Peloton report that says, you know, here's how much you worked out and who you worked out with and how many calories you burned and everything else. Um, so it's becoming more of a, a direct thing that users expect. So channeling it through just a, a dedicated data product manager doesn't even make much sense anymore because the user doesn't expect to be like, oh, well, you need to go to the little hamburger menu at the top and hit admin tools. And there's a thing called reports and you load up the reports. And when you go into the reports, you do go to the report builder. Like now they're just like, <laughs> what are you even talking about? Like, I expect when I click on something, you're going to throw up, you know, like three donut charts and a little line graph telling me about what's going on in my life. Um, so I'm starting to see that be a lot more embedded in people's roles. And then I'd say, you know, the third category has always been uh, the, the analytics about the product, which is, you know, all, all of the dashboards, all of the folks on LinkedIn that are contacting you right now that are trying to sell you uh, right. uh, ver various analytics tools about customer usage and everything else. Um, I've just seen more and more that products get built with that baked in now, where it's, it's just more assumed that your product is primarily a data collection platform. Uh, the data about the product is the data in the product. And when you set it up in the first place, it's going to have a pretty good analytics layer. It's going to export to Snowflake or whatever other analytics platform it is. Um, and it's just going to kind of work like that. And I'm starting to see like a lot of the things that were specialties five years ago were just kind of commoditized and table stakes now. And then going forward, it's just kind of expected like product manager can get their hands on that stuff. Yeah. So it turned from like kind of a niche area to just table stakes for, for getting, for doing a good job in product management. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, you know, most product managers I know, know at least rudimentary SQL and most of the products they're working on don't even require them to be doing much SQL diving anymore because now they can kind of get their hands on more advanced analytical tools that just, uh, tell them things that used to require days and days of digging. Do you, uh, do you have a favorite uh, analytics tool that you use? Again, we're, we're not sponsored by any of these folks, so they're, they're all, this is all just opinion here. Uh, I honestly have never found anything that quite lives up to the promise. Um, I've, <laughs> uh, I've enjoyed, you know, Snowflake is great as a analytics data layer. Um, Looker is really good. I'd say what I find is helpful is not actually the tool that I use to understand the data. It's the tool that I use to create dashboards for people and disseminate the knowledge so mm. that people can make their own decisions. Um, and tools like Looker are really good for that. They're really good uh, 
you know, for standing something up, Shiny is also good just for, you know, creating a dashboard for someone so that they can answer that question themselves every day from now on instead of them constantly asking you. Yeah, t- teach a person to fish type deal type. Uh, yeah, scenario. exactly. Um, and I've found that you know the, the the most satisfying things with the highest leverage. Uh, when I'm talking about how do I enable other people in my org, it's always been get them the right level of data access that they can understand and that they can act on every day. Um, and it also just makes my life easier then because I don't have to spend all my time answering the same request over. How do you uh, avoid analysis paralysis where, you know, there's so much data, you know, you might have a dashboard, but there's just too much in it for, for someone to see the, the signal from the noise. Yeah. I mean, I think the, a lot of the analysis paralysis comes when you uh, start from the data and say, oh, there's answers in the data, but you don't actually know what your question is quite yet. Um, I find it's it's helpful to come to it looking for what exactly are we trying to answer to do what. Um, and that's got to be driven by what's your roadmap, what's your timeline. Um, like, for instance, Media Alpha, we're doing a lot of lead generation and ad tech. Say we're doing stuff uh, for health, life, Medicare. Open enrollment is coming up towards the end of the year. Um, working right. our way backwards from that, there's a clock and any questions we have about what's working in the space, whether it's, you know, helping people with front ends, whether it's helping people with bidding algorithms, whether it's helping people with lead dissemination, helping people be compliant with do not call that kind of thing. Um, it's all got a, it, it's all got a deadline. Um, and if you have a hard deadline and you time box it, it's a lot easier to say, look, we are going to go with the best answer we have by tomorrow at 3 PM. Oh, interesting. And that's really how you need to operate with this stuff because you can just spend forever digging in Excel and everything else. But uh, if you uh, if you just say what we actually have is a a deadline by which we need to take an action, then it's it's a great focus of lens. That's a terrific tip, and uh, not one that I've heard of yet. So I've I've heard of you know asking the question first rather than just going to the data and trying to explore. But this idea of really time boxing your, your solution because there are so many different data points you can get. Um, I'm sure there's a, a chart you can create with the diminishing returns of the amount of time that you keep pouring into it versus the, the amount of time you actually need to, to get 80% of the way there. I'm pretty sure I've created that chart. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and for, we're almost at time here. And to ask the, the final question, we always ask of all of our guests, uh, this is product in LA. Uh, one of the fun things we ask is, uh, what is the most LA thing that's uh, happened to you? This could be product related or not. Yeah, so we actually moved to LA uh, during the pandemic, um, and we started to get into a, a subset of the LA things because we weren't doing a lot of like the indoor fun things. <laughs> uh, but we're doing the hiking, and we're doing the uh, going to Joshua Tree, going to Santa Barbara, going down to oh, San yeah. Diego, and such. Like, uh, and, and really getting part of the LA experience is uh, escaping LA, and we. Uh, <laughs> We'd gone into the, hey, maybe we could live in Joshua Tree, like, because so, there's places you go within two or three hours of L.A. that are just, uh, they're impactful. Like, you, you go out at night somewhere and you see the stars and you're like, man, well, why don't I live here? Um, and earlier this year, we did that with Santa Barbara that we realized, like, hey, we, we keep coming up here. We absolutely love it here. It's two hours from L.A. Um, and, and we made the jump and, and moved here. So I think probably the most LA thing I've done is uh, thought about how I could live in Santa Barbara or Joshua Tree or somewhere without traffic. But uh, maybe the difference is I, I pulled the trigger and now uh, when when I need to go into the office, I drive in two hours. And when I don't, I drive uh, 10 minutes to the beach. <laughs> As a, I mean, you could say the same exact thing from within LA. You could still do that two hour commute from within the grounds of Los Angeles. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, Thank you so much, David, for, for ta- talking with us today. Really appreciate your time. Really appreciate your stories. This has been really been amazing. All right. Thanks a lot, Ethan. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I, I just want to add just a third pitch. That mentorship program that Ethan talked about is absolutely fantastic. You will meet some great people, um, whichever end of it you're on. Um, and it's also a wonderful way to meet people on the West Coast and really uh, see some different perspectives of what product management is. 
Thank you so much, David. Again, that's uh, pma.la slash mentorship. Uh, terrific and really worthwhile program. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for listening to us, and uh, we'll see you next time on Product in L.A.